Take it away. Welcome to the uh, to the panel on digital immortality. We are going to uh, go over the some of the things. Let me read the uh, the description here. Science fiction is always conceived of many possible ways to use computing devices to extend life: AI, cybernetics, personality emulation, hive minds, and many more. One of the, some of the most memorable stories in this area. And what approaches have they suggested? What risks have they posed? How likely are any of them to be realized in our natural lifetimes? Uh, before we get into the subject matter of this session, uh, let, uh, let my panelists uh, say a few words, of promote whatever they've got out published recently and uh, their comments on what makes them an expert in this area. Because I see all of these people are relatively young. Doc, you want to start? I can start. Uh, I'm Doc Coleman. I'm a steampunk author. Um, and I'm, I'm also a big fan of, of uh, science fiction in, in general. And uh, I tend to take a, a, a more philosophical view of it. A lot of people are, are looking at being able to move a human consciousness into computers in order to preserve it. And uh, that makes me wonder how really how much we are data and are is is there another element that might be missing um, sort of the, the 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 spiritual versus the digital so i'm looking forward to this conversation karen hi my name I'm is karen. oh which one of us aaron. <laughs> oh, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i didn't even think about that sorry aaron Karen. Okay. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Karen Osborne. I'm the author of Architects of Memory and Engines of Oblivion from Tor Books. They are the Memory War series. And without getting into too many spoilers, they have to do something with um, immortality and digital immortality, both alien and human. Um, I have been interested in the subject since I realized um, that I was never going to escape my Xena Warrior Princess high school fan site um, when it came up in a um, job interview in my late 20s. Um, so I've always been interested in how the internet um, prolongs that and where that sort of thing is going to go. So um, I'm really glad to be here and can't wait for the conversation. Okay, thank you. Aaron? My name is Aaron Roth. I am a uh, scientist. I'm uh, doing research in robotics and artificial intelligence at the University of Maryland. Uh, and I am also a science fiction author. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of overlap in the panels I'm on for some reason. And here, I was uh, talking on, on earlier on, uh, uh, on, on simple mortality, but when we were talking about alternative ways and other parts of the few fantastic futures and all. So uh, we, this, I think the danger of this subject is that we'll uh, switch off of, of uh, immortality, machine immortality, and go into the other side of it as actual immortality. So uh, I think the only thing we have to worry about on digital immortality is whether our Microsoft licenses are updated or not. So Karen, do you wanna start off the uh, discussion? Well, it's, it's interesting that you say something about Microsoft licenses because we have to be very careful of that going forward. Um, we used to own software and we used to buy it and hold it and keep it on our shelves. And now we only own the, um, we only own the privilege of using it. Um, uh, when I'm not writing, I, I, I'm a video editor um, and um, I pay every month to use Adobe, um, Adobe Creative Suite. And if I stop paying it, well, there goes my ability to make money. Um, and so as a science fiction author, you kind of spin this out a bit. Um, one of the things I watched, I, 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 it, it's a fun show on Amazon. Um, and it, the name is escaping, the, the, the name of it is escaping me right now. Um, I think it might be Upload. And it's about somebody who dies and is uploaded to um, 
a digital afterlife and all of the um, and all of the stuff that comes with it, um, with licenses. And do you really own your own, per, you know, your own self and your own um, personality? Uh, so I'm always I'm 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 a little worried about <laughs> some of those um, licensing things that are coming up because they look like they're going to save you money, but they might actually end up in your entire brain being owned by a corporation. That's an interesting perspective. Aaron, do you have something to say? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a real issue. Um, I think you know, that 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 Karen brought up about, you know, if uh, you have a mind existing on a digital substrate, who will own that substrate? Because unlike, you know, in the real world, you can imprison a person or you can require them to pay for food or, or other life necessities, but ultimately the person themselves is always themselves. Uh, whereas in a digital substrate, I mean, I guess the main difference is that because you could also imagine if this digital sub, if this digital person was contained within a robot body, then you could say, well, okay, but at least then that's self-contained and they could prevent updates they didn't want or et cetera, or hopefully they would have the foresight to be able to exist without connection to the internet, you know, like these Adobe software products. Um, or at least some of that kind of business model, I don't know if Adobe specific, like they won't even work if you're not connected to the internet. So how horrible would that be if you were a digital soul, but you could only work if you were connected to the internet. Um, so that's, that's a, a separate issue too. But even after that, um, you, know, you might say, well, if you have a robot body, then, then it's okay. But it's not okay because uh, as, as was shown in the show upload, most very often when people talk about digital uploads, they sort of, implicitly say, and you'll be able to exist in this uh, virtual reality afterlife space. And so most people are already conceiving of the, of the digital immortality being not either not limited to the real, to the physical world, or even not even taking place in the physical world entirely. And in which case these kind of issues of, well, who owns the physical, the physical components that enable that digital world to exist would come into to focus a lot. Yeah, I think um, I think it's Doc's turn right now. Yeah, uh, I, I find so many of these things interesting. I, I've, I've hit a lot of sources. Some of them are, are, are really old sources, like uh, Frederick Pohl's EG series, uh, where the, the the main character ends up being a. Uh, 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 living out so much of his life and then being uploaded into the computer and, and continuing uh, uh, his adventures as an uploaded person. Uh, the, the, the upload series, of course, um, the web comic Schlock Mercenary uh, had a huge finale that involved uh, uh, not, just, not just transitioning from a fleshy life into a digital life, but making uh, making regular backups of the mercenary uh, uh, company so that if they got killed during a mission, you could grow a new body and and re uh, re download uh, that personality. And and at the end, they actually said, you know, okay, we can't send people there, but we can send programs. So they sent started sending duplicates of people, uh, and it it creates some very interesting questions in terms of identity, uh, especially in, in things like upload, where it's like, uh, not, only, not only does this, this character find himself uploaded into a digital environment, he finds out his memories have been edited. So is he really the same person uh, uh, that, that got digitized or is he now someone new? And does he want those memories back? Um, it, it's a lot of very, very interesting philosophical area. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the uh, literature on uh, digital immortality seems to overlap with the singularity. Uh, Kurzweil, I think, uh, says, you know, we'll be digital beings after the singularity, as if that made anything. Matter of fact, I wrote a story about that, so uh, one among many. Uh, I think the thing that worries me about uh, 
if, we, if we're talking about computers and electronics on there, what about clock speed? Clock speed of a, a computer cycles X number of cycles per second on there, which is adjustable. So if you're uploaded, do you live at the same rate as the human beings? In other words, if you got uploaded and then your wife followed after you, you, you were uploaded by say five minutes, perhaps a couple of years have elapsed and you've forgotten what she looks like. That would be a horror story, I guess, on there. I would, I would say, yeah, more, more perceptive time would have elapsed, but since you have a computer memory, you would not have be forgetting it if you didn't want to, unless it was badly written program. It, and it, in the, the Schlock mercenary story, they actually directly addressed that. And you had, you had people who were visitors who were being hosted on somebody else's hardware. So the hosts ran themselves at a much higher clock time uh, uh, than the guests so that they could, uh, they could figure out what was going on before they, they really interacted with these people. Uh, so yeah, t time, time and experience now becomes a flexible medium. Um, and you can also slow your thinking down in order to preserve power. Yeah, I loved how even though you had um, one set of characters, the, 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 the live set of characters outside on their way to do whatever it is they're doing. I mean, I, I, I completely forgot sometimes that happens. Um, but the characters inside on the slower clock speed are doing things like learning new skills and, and uh, training for fights and um, making you. thousands of cakes and doing all sorts of things that um, their live uh, cohorts um, can and what I think is it, it, what I think is interesting too is that some of the characters uh, romantically end up with different people on on both ends. So you get to as as a reader you get to look at that and go, ooh, I wonder what choices they made and where they diverge. Um, and and you have to ask, are they the same people or are they the different people? It's kind of like um, the ship of Theseus in a way. Oh, okay. I was reading the comments over there about the uh, about clock speed on there. Yeah, Jennifer made a good comment that I was also going to say that um, you would be able to adjust your clock speed, and uh, uh, that Larry uh, brought up that uh, there's a story where digital people just slow themselves down, interact with flesh and blood people. Uh, but I was also thinking you could adjust clock speed as, as Doc was saying, you know, to get different people running at different rates, or it could even be done maliciously. You could slow someone down if you didn't want them to act. <laughs> well, what was, if you're, if you're digitalized, what's to prevent somebody from making say 50 or 60 copies, identical copies of you, and then saying, let's stage a bank robbery. Okay. Well, Nothing. well, presumably your copies would not want to, rob a bank well, how any more than you do. How else are you going to pay for robber, the storage? If you were a bank robber, you could be your own crew. Also, also, <laughs> if you make copies, if you make digital, if you make copies like that, why wouldn't the bank robber just make copies of himself? Why would he make copies of someone else? Because keep in mind, if you made a copy, it's still a digital copy. If it's contained on a computer, a computer can't rob a bank. Robbing a bank is a physical thing, unless you're talking about uh, a a digital sort of uh, a digital sort of theft, which which can occur at various means. But um, again, a copy of a person, at least at the point of differentiation, would still be that person. Well, you know, th this reminds me of uh, another older story, which unfortunately the name is, and the author escape me right now. But it was a space exploration story where uh, a, a couple was trained up on Earth and then their memories were scanned. And uh, she was loaded into the computer as the ship's AI and he was loaded in as uh, uh, the, the maintenance bot that, that kept the ship running. So... Those instances were in the ship during their long travel looking for other habitable worlds. But when they found a world, uh, they would grow 
uh, 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 oh. they would grow organic bodies uh, in a lab that were suited to survival on that particular world and then implant those personalities into those bodies and send those bodies down to the world. And it's like every everything was a one-way trip. You just created off another copy and, and sent it where it needed to go. Um, yeah, the, uh, but that isn't really immortality because that is, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so fascinating, but it's not, it's not you. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the Star Trek um, transporter question. It, um, it's yeah. Is, is, is that really you coming out the other end or is it someone else completely whose life began at that moment? If you were, if you were living in a computer, could you tell if somebody was altering something basic about you? In other words, could you rise above the noise in the system? That question is very similar to the question of, would we know if we're living in, living in a simulation? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that at a certain level, someone should just check sums, sure. But, you know, keep in mind, in most cases, a checksum is being performed by a... Uh, application outside of the application on which the checksum is being performed it's a little more tricky for an application to run uh, a checksum on itself or, or and you know so a um that i was just responding to a comment in the chat but um you know can a um can we know if we're if it, it can a mind know what it is in I think at a certain level, you can always create something where the mind will not know. In fact, it's very difficult for it to create a situation where it will know everything about what it is. Obviously, there's a lot of space, or maybe not obviously, but there's a lot of space, I think, where you can give a, a digital entity ability to understand a lot about itself. Um, and I think that's obviously desirable. But um, I think at a certain level, there will always be this sort of supremacy of the physical world. But that's just my opinion. Uh, just a note to everybody that uh, we have a Q&A over here, and if you have questions to, you want the panelists to address, uh, please put them in the Q&A rather than chat, because they tend to get lost when they get in the chat. Okay, sorry for interrupting. Where were we? Uh, well, I, 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 I saw in the chat um, mal malicious meat space editing. Um, and uh, I mean, humans in bodies are are susceptible to mimetic viruses, as I mean, as we're seeing right now with, uh, for example, QAnon. Um, so it, I, I absolutely think it would be similar in a digital in a digital thing because well unless you unless you program it at which point is it really a human brain anymore or is it just something else something different. Um, so um, I, I, I definitely think that if, like I definitely think that you could be a digital person and not know you're being edited. It, it, it definitely becomes a, a interesting question of, are, are you being edited on the fly? Are you running software that someone is, is is trying to tinker with, or can they stop you and then edit you and then start you up again? Um, do you notice the discontinuity? Um, do you, if, and it goes back into, uh, are, are we the software or are we the database? Um, are, is your identity a, a, a particular function of uh, the associations that you make and how you process them, or are you are you the database? Are you just the the sum of the memories that's running a standard uh, uh, emulation software? And you know, if somebody changes or replaces a memory, will you notice it if if you don't think about it? Uh, will, will you notice that somebody has removed your memory uh, because? because there's now a hole in a part of your life but it's like in meat space how many times can we like 
I just can't remember what that thing was. I knew that I knew it, but now I can't remember it. Um, which is which is all a function of how RNA memory works, um, because some sometimes things just get disconnected. Um, One of the things that we're we're approaching sort of a Jungian definition of the, the structure of a digital being. We have the ego, we have the id, etc., and all. So you're talking right now about identity being the id part of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there. Uh, I wrote a book where people were uploaded to uh, machines. Marines became uh, super superior soldiers. The problem was that in transferring, you had to sacrifice a lot of memories. And that was the premise that, that they were working around through the whole book. It's called Shattered Dreams. Uh, so still out there. Uh, in, they, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Self-editing also is what would be a, an issue on there. What if you wanted to go back and change your bad memories into good memories? Would you change the value system that you use to judge or would you change the events themselves? Say so looking at something like Westworld, uh, yeah. when, they, when, they, when the AIs actually start getting in, in control of, uh, get to handle their own- control. This is a spoiler by the way, but it's a good example. Yeah. It's, it's happened in the first season. We're now past season three. So your own statute of limitations. But you know, one of the characters just, she got a hold of her controls. She just pushed everything to the max. Um, you know, it's the idea of being able to, to, to tailor your own personality on the fly. Um, and somebody in the chat just brought up uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in terms yeah, of, of editing your own memories, you know, that that's in meat space, but um, and it's uh, probably a good example of once you start once you start playing with your memories, how much are things going to fall apart? Yeah, what I found <laughs> fascinating by the sunshine sunshine of a spotless mind is how much that parallels uh, Ted Chang's uh, arrival. You have the same sort of time shifting in there. You're not sure where the story starts and where you came in. Karen, you wanted to say something earlier. Oh, I was um I in 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 these books, uh the the memory question is central. Um and I guess you could uh, approach it from a number of ways. Um I, I would always think about, you know, that eternal sun, sunshine of the spotless mind. You know, I, I have a couple of formative things in my life where I thought about it and I'm like, would I get rid of them if I could? Like, if, if I were to upload myself, would I be a better person? Would I be a different person, for example, if I hadn't been um, on, on the corner, you know, on the corner of on the corner of, cor cor corner of Elm and Swan like three days before Christmas uh, 2006 like stuff like that and um and uh so when so sorry I had a I had a I had a thing here um so when the characters go through the book they 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 lose memories um based on one particular thing happening um but I don't but but they don't notice because I was thinking if if that was taken away I would have responded to a whole bunch of different things differently um I I would have a different set of anxieties I would have a different set of something so so my entire life would be different if that one memory was taken away um but I would never know um and I think and I think well I mean while in meat space you have complete control but I think um moving forward, you have to think about um, when, when it comes to editing you, uh, who has the, who, who, who owns you, who has the power. Um, for example, um, there's that old adage, uh, if, you, if, if you don't know what the product is online, you are the product. Um, like social media, you are the product on social media. They are selling you, you are selling yourself. Um, so I, I, I would be very concerned uh, that companies uh, would, would come in and make those edits and you'd never know. 
there's a system out there in the internet called Second Life. I, I'm, yeah, everybody's played it. It's interesting. I've been, I got into that when it was first starting, uh, when it was really, really, really crude and the entire universe could be put on one screen. Uh, what's interesting is looking at the characters in there. People, when they come on, tend to tend toward idealizing themselves. They tend to tend to uh, change into aspects of their personality or their physical appearance. Physical appearance is one of the first things. I sometimes wonder, uh, I wrote an article about this uh, on there, that uh, you see a beautiful woman in a bikini walking down the beach, very, very possibly walking to you and talking to you. Even though you know that guy is a fat guy in New Jersey who's sitting there in his underwear on this, you're still, you're still reacting to the appearance that you have, not to the person. And it's a deception. So when you, when you edit your digital self, are you being true to yourself, true to everybody else? Is it a, is it a costume? I mean, I'd also like to say, um, just taking it from a different perspective, we're talking very globally about modifying a digital person, and that might not even be possible, or it might be very difficult. And you might say, well, what do you mean? They're difficult. You might say, we don't understand how the human brain works, but truly, if we can upload someone, a prerequisite to that is either understanding it, or at the very least, we will understand whatever gets uploaded, even if it's something different than a human, we'll understand it and it can be modified, et cetera. But that's not necessarily true, because if you look at a lot of AIs today that are not sentient AIs, they're just you know AIs, uh, some of them are not comprehensible to humans, but they work and they do things and they solve tasks. And so uh, the, the idea, I don't think we can take it for granted that such modifications will be possible or easy, um, but obviously it's a fun thing to think about. A good example of that idea is David Brin's Kiln People. Yeah. Kiln yeah. People, yeah. Kiln People, yes. where they discovered a, a, a particular function that they referred to as the soul wave and found that they could to take that imprint from a, a living person, put it into an artificial body or multiple artificial bodies which could be sent out into the world to do functions and then come back at the end of the day and re-upload all those memories into the, the biological body. Um, so you didn't necessarily get immortality as much as you got multiplicity. Um, but that's, that's an interesting take of having a technology that we can use even though we don't understand all the elements. Um, the integration would be very difficult. I, I think we would make modifications um, because we do that now. Um, you know, who I, I, I know um, I put on makeup to go outside. Um, people experience dysphoria in their in the bodies they were born with and and um and 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 need to look elsewhere. You know, it's um, you know, people lose weight, they gain weight, they they um, look at Instagram and go, I want to be that. And they try to be that, even though it's not real. Um, so you're going to get uh, people, people being people. Um, and I think that in a digital world, people would want, you know, wings and, <laughs> and tails and um, to, to change themselves into what they want to be. Um, whether or not that's the best thing for them, Probably, you know, I mean, it, it so, sometimes it isn't. I mean, that's a horrible thought to have a pack of furries run, running around. But, well, we do, don't we? <laughs> they finally have the bodies they've always wanted, right? Yes. But the, uh, the, the other aspect is that once, once you have voluntary editing, um, then what kind of a crime is involuntarily editing someone else? Um, you know, and you just gave me a story idea, thanks. If, if you've got uh, digital political figures, uh, uh, national leaders who are, are, are digitally represented or, or even just have digital backups to prevent them from being assassinated, 
No, what happens when you have people hacking that? Uh, deep fakes of deep fakes of deep fakes, so people don't know it's real anymore. Well, it's like you go go yeah, and, sorry, go and edit the backup of a national leader and then assassinate him. So now he's under your control. <sighs> well, it used to oh be the, the pictures were were would explain something on there. Now you can't even trust the images that you see. Yeah, there is there's a lot of story ideas being thrown around here. <laughs> well, it yeah, it it makes me wonder just how much like like the mimetic thought viruses would would spread so much faster in in uh in a place where people lived in a you know digi digitally immortal world. Um I, I, I mean, you'd think that you, I mean, you would think that people having access to more information probably at a clock speed that is bigger and more, more, you know, and faster than they did in their regular bodies would be able to check that. But we know, um, you know, we know humans have um, choice paralysis. Uh, we walk into a grocery store and there are 17 racks of potato chips and we don't know which one to pick. We just sit there and stare at the potato chips. It's much better hey, if, if you, you have if... one, two, three, and then you can pick one. Um, I wonder how that would kind of, I wonder how that would work um, in a digitally immortal world. Well, at first you'd have a year, perceptive year to stand in that aisle. So you, it'd be fine. But on the other hand, then there'd be 10,000 varieties that would grow for you to choose from to accommodate that. So you'd have the same issue, but you'd also maybe have, forever. you'd also be able to, you know, get in your, uh, uh, create your custom algorithms and get in some uh, routines to help you decide things. So I think, I think a lot of those sort of human foibles could be obviated, although maybe we would say, hopefully they would not be. Then are you still a human if you don't have any of those human psychological uh, deficiencies? Um, does it matter? <laughs> um, I have to question is why a digital piece or why a digital figure would want to have potato chips? Well, I, I, good. I just brought up in my mind is the, is the whole idea of the digital personal assistant, which was was the original idea behind things like the iPhone, the iPad, and it's like okay, so now we can copy your personality and put it into a program. So. You are your digital personal assistant. So you're going grocery shopping and it's like you're looking at potato chips. So you pull out your, your, your phone device and you ask yourself which of these is the best. And that version of you ups their clock time, goes out on the internet, does all the research and comes back and makes a suggestion. Sort of like having a graduate student. <laughs> you're, 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 you're assuming that the the executive function of the person is, <laughs> is there. <laughs> oh, I would not want to do all that research. I mean, we're 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 also, you know, Bud Bud make a good point that made me think of something, which is that like uh, you know, we're talking about these digital people doing things that physical humans do, but the digital people don't need to do them. And a lot of what we do as humans, including a lot of things in the societies we create are related to our physical needs and physical desires. Um, and, then, and then some of it is related to other things, like uh, maybe, maybe societal things that'll, that'll still exist, but like we won't need to eat. We won't, uh, we won't need uh, you know, healthcare uh, beyond uh, the upkeep of our, uh, our servers. So the, um, and maybe some defrags or whatever the equivalent is. I mean, I can't make too sweeping a statements, but uh, a lot of these things that physical humans need, digital uh, beings, if they exist, would not need. And so what would be their, what would replace that? What would be their desires? You know, probably they wouldn't go to a supermarket, but maybe they would go to a convention hall to interact with other beings or something. Uh, but, uh, you know, would you would you want a life that's basically um you have like infinite discords but you can't eat well the question is what what desires would you have what desires go away hunger is certainly something that would go away uh you would want uh, lust might go away it might be morphed into something else but a lot of what we we react to and, and act on are 
done by our hormones and other chemicals in our body. Now, if those don't exist, if we don't feel pain, if we don't uh, get tired, you know, what sort of being would we become? Would be, would we, how long would it take before we are non-human in our aspect? I was gonna say an, another, another way of looking at that is, is it a one-way transfer? Can you only go from being flesh to being digital? Or can, can you then go at some later time, go from digital to being flesh? And this is kind of uh, goes back to, to uh, uh, killing people in terms of part of the aspect of that was at the end of the day, the, 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 the kiln person could preserve their, their memories by rejoining with the original person. And that's kind of like, uh, if you think of your memories as being a bucket of water, you dipper some out into a glass at the end of the day, you pour that back in and they're, they're all merged together. You're, as a digital person, you then have a common identity with your, your flesh person. Um, but if it's a one-way transfer, then once once you go digital, you never go back. Um, it, it does begin to be very interesting in terms of what do you put aside? Would it drive someone mad to never feel the wind on their face or, or to, to never eat their favorite foods again? Well, being going back to the supermarket thing, you know, what would replace going after potato chips instead of other kinds of chips? Would you bargain for increased memory? Would you bargain for uh, faster clock speed, as we mentioned earlier? Uh, what, are, what are the drivers of a digital being? Or, or could you just replay that memory of when you did it in body? Maybe you'd get try to get more food for your children, I mean, who are still alive or something. Um, you know, Doc was talking about uh, you know, whether what's possible or not. And by the way, I'm also a fan of killing people. Uh, and Doc was, was talking about, you know, if it's possible to go back. I mean, as was mentioned in the, in the, in the chat by Larry Kramer, you know, it's not even clear if it's possible to go from, from human to digital. That's still an unanswered question. I, for example, you know, I'm talking about it as, as if it's real, uh, be, you know, taking the assumption that it, that it, that it could happen. But if I if if you ask me, could it happen? I'd probably say no. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible. I think it might be possible to create something. I think it might be possible to create a facsimile. I don't think it's possible to create a copy of a human in a, in a, in, a, in a digital uh, digital format. Um, I don't think that's possible. I I think it'd be cool if I was proven wrong. But that's my opinion. Now let's say that I am proven wrong, and then and then uh, we we have. Uh, digital people. And then you can say, okay, well, can you then take a digital and go back to biological? But that's even more difficult. And it's not just a matter of encoding information. It's also because brains, like if you have a digital substrate and you can put the information on it, you can, you can, you can, if you get it on there, like you, it's, it's on there uh, and it's not going to degrade and it, it's a certain kind of material. Uh, not with physical material, a certain kind of structure, but uh, a biological body, a biological brain. Let's say you had a clone. Let's say you grew some sort of clone body that was, and it grew to an adult human or even a child or whatever that's beyond a baby, but something with a brain capacity. And then it was just lifeless. So there's no ethical issues and it has no functions, whatever. And then you want to try to imprint something on its brain that's stored in a computer. You know, how would you go about that? It's much more difficult than the reverse. Even if the first is possible, the second is much more difficult. Um, so, but it makes for good stories for sure. Um, I mean, I would think that if we could, if we could read the, the memory RNA in order to digitize you in the first place, you should also be able to create a program that's going to determine what kind of memory RNA you need to put into a biological body in order to, to transfer data the other way. Well, let's say you could even theoretically model that. Mm -hmm. Physically, how would you do it? Because, because you can't, like for computer memory, you could lay it all out. You could, you could put it in 
and then you could start it when you want. You can't do that with a brain. You can't like, you know, even if you go at like zero Kelvin, so you say, okay, we're not going to have any of the brain process until we load it all in. Like, it's a physical thing. Are you going to, maybe it, if it's, po if it would be possible, maybe it could be possible without using a human brain. If you just have like a long, something more accessible, something designed to be externally accessible and something designed to be loaded from without, maybe a different biological structure could work, but I don't, I don't, I mean, the question I'm raising is, is not simply from a uh, information knowledge standpoint, but from the sort of the physics of it and the biology of it, the process. of loading the data. Yeah. The, 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 the closest guess I can give you right now is there was another story that I read, which I can picture the damn cover. I can't remember the, the title of the author, but it was in a world where people had frozen them, uh, frozen themselves, hoping that some uh, a future generation would uh, uh, heal whatever killed them and, and, and restore them. And what those future generations did is when they had convicted criminals, they needed personalities to put into those bodies. So they took the corpsicles, the frozen people, and they basically harvested the memory RNA and then in, wiped the personality in the, the criminal and injected uh, uh, the, the new personality and, and basically treated those people as slaves. Um, they, they, they just needed a personality to, to, to make this body useful again and if you didn't work out, well, they'll just wipe you and grab another corpsicle off the stack. Um, but um, that that might hint at a at a, a possible methodology. But again, we're we're in speculative fiction. We're going out ahead of where science is. <laughs> yes. I, I tend to write stories sometimes where if I can't explain it with science, I'll say, I want to deal with these questions. So I'm just going to say it happened. Um, and that isn't that isn't always um, everyone's cup of tea. That's why you know you, you, go, you go up from hard to soft and everything in between, you know. Um, um, you have Andy Weir up here and then you have like Star Wars or whatever. Um, I, I was just thinking about um, there there was a um, there there was a comment if you are uploaded why do you assume that there would not be hunger or other desires programmed in and and I've just been turning that over in my head for the past um, for the past like fifteen minutes since it was there because I was just like oh because um, if if you're torturing someone this is going to get graphic. Um, if you're torturing someone, what do you do? You take away food, you take away water, you take away sleep. Um, and what is a life without that? It, it could be nothing but torture because all of those things that make us who we are have been taken away. Um, no sleep, no food, no water, no, yeah, yeah, I mean, and 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 you could say feelings. Feelings come from up here too. They are, they are, they are neurons and and chemicals. Um, so without those chemicals, um, what what happens there? Um, that's that was my that was my thought on that. Well, Karen, you mentioned you mentioned something. I think when you get to the spot where you can't explain something, you use something called verisimilitude. You describe mm -hmm. it as if it does exist and would exist and all, and not yes. give any background to it. Keep going. It's a little writer's trick. Oh, they, yes. It's they never catch easy. on. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, I, I, I used to worry so much about everything not being real, and I used to get re really into my physics textbooks and be like, oh, I got to make it real. No, nope, you just you just keep on going. Just yeah. just go ahead and, and, and deal with the fun questions. But you got to do it well. People let you get away with it. <laughs> what? As long as you don't do it too much, people let you get away with it. <laughs> it's, yeah, well, it's um, internal consistency, internal consistency in your verisimilitude. Um, if, 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 you're in, you're, if, if, if your worlds aren't internally consistent around the things that you're changing, then, then that's what gets you in trouble. Aaron, you wanted to say something a few minutes ago. Uh, no, I just, I, I agree with, uh, with what people are saying about, 
uh, from the writing so I was my previous comment was really from the science perspective, but from a writing perspective, uh, I agree. You know, put it if you want to put it in your story, put it in your story. And if and I mean, I personally like sometimes to write more hard and sometimes to write more soft and sometimes. I sit down and I think I'm going to write something hard. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put some aliens in and, you know, <laughs> cause uh, so I think that's good to do. And I think the advice people are giving is good. Put it in there. And the key is internal consistency. That's, that's what realism is. Like you can take whatever sort of logical gaps or assumptions you make, as long as they're consistent assumptions, you say faster than light travels. Okay. All right. People accept that you say, digital upload is what happens. People accept it. You know, if you have, so if, if you, you know, as long as it's internally consistent, because as, as uh, my fellow panelists are saying, that's what science fiction is about is exploring these possibilities. Um, and if we did not explore these possibilities, we would not be incentivizing people to try to explore them in real life. So it also has practical benefit. I think one of the questions we haven't addressed is how do you create new memories as a digital being? Eventually you're going to run out of memory space. What happens then? Does the oldest memories get dropped off or are you more selective in that? Could you be more selective in that? Isn't that kind of how, like, I, I, I feel like that's what happens to us as human beings as we get older and we make more memories and some of the older ones kind of become faded and um, not as important to us anymore. But I can't imagine not being able to make new memories. <laughs> Was I think you'd have person. to, you'd have, well, well, you'd have to pay your, you'd have to pay your, um, your corporate overlords. You have to pay your extra fee there, your license fee for your extra memory space or get your descendants to do it. And what happens when you're 300 descendants down the line and they don't even know who you are and they don't care. Or you slow down your clock speed so that you make memories slower. As an old person, I'd say it is, it isn't the things that had long ago that drop off. It's the things that happened a half hour ago. <laughs> Because you need to pay for new memory. Yes. Oh. In, in, in terms of, of preserving digital memories, well, you start getting into encryption and and uh, and lossy encryption so that you can maximize your use of the space. So, yeah, things that don't seem very important, they get encrypted with, with, with lossy encryption that you know that you did it, but the experience of doing it is not that important. So details get left out. Um, There's a simple me memory test that anybody can do at home. You uh, think of 10 objects, doesn't matter what they are, what, whether they're all alike, similar or whatnot. Think of 10 items, put them down on a list and then put the list somewhere. Wait about a half hour. And try and excuse me, and set a timer for a half hour. And then after an hour, when the time goes off, you try to remember why you set the timer. <laughs> yeah, why is it? We always remember that we put something in a safe place, but we never remember what the safe place was. All the it's time. always the last the place you look. That's because if you found it, you wouldn't keep looking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think we're about running out of time here. Uh, anybody have any final comments to make? I can't believe I'm on a science fiction convention and the panelists don't have anything to say. <laughs> well, let's meet back on the server 100 years from now and compare notes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 more, oh, the more I discuss, the more, the more I write about this, the scarier it gets like it just gets scarier and scarier and scarier i was thinking about your lossy thing and you know I, i'm in graphics and and video so you save a video over and over or a jpeg over and over and you just lose the pixels and lose the pixels um and it kind of looks the same a little bit but you've lost so much information that it's just not the same picture and and that just that gives me the shivers i have to say oh uh. I ask everybody to please put their comments, their web page, or whatever you want up on the server, on the chat, so that people can take a look at it later. No, uh, give you all a few minutes to do that. I put my website in the 
in the chat. Oh, yes, I see. And, uh, oh, you know, even though I expressed that I don't think it's possible, I do enjoy thinking about it a lot. And there are scientists who believe that it is possible. So it's, it's very much uh, within the realm of, of uh, theoretical possibility, according to some, some people who think about it. Well, that's, it, it whole, occurred, that's the whole that's the, faith we have in science fiction. It tells you what might happen, what might occur, and explores the ideas. Right, but there is also a lot of things in science fiction that like scientists know is not possible or probably not possible. But there are a surprising number of actual scientists who believe that this is possible. So I thought that was worth people knowing. <laughs> it's kind of a surprise to me, but it's true. Well, for brains and clock speeds, um, I highly recommend this book I just read, um, Sarah Pinsker's We Are Satellites, which uh, kind of, um, which, which deals with uh, brain uh, memory and um, uh, multitasking brain implants. And, and it's kind of a family story. Um, and it kind of chronicles the beginning of something of this technology. It's like, it, it takes place like the day after tomorrow. Um, and it's just a fabulous book. And I think if you are here at this panel, you'd probably be interested in it. I'll put that in the chat. Doc? Um, I don't know. I, I like, like Karen, I find this, this whole thing fascinating and to a certain amount terrifying. Um, but if we don't try to think ahead about this stuff, then the, the science will never go there. Uh, and and uh, uh, Star Trek has definitely proved that, that once, once somebody comes up with the idea, science usually finds a way to make it happen. So it, it should be, be very interesting to, to see how things develop and, and whether or not it's, it's me or some personality successor of me that, that, that goes on into the future. We'll come back to this and look at the recording of this session. <laughs> and uh, if somebody has changed anything in there, you might not notice it. Oh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. This has been a most interesting discussion. And I've got about 10 story ideas out of this. this. So thank you very much. All right. Good day. See you all over in Water Table. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.